That's what it's all about. Kenny G entering the classical realm, oh. performing at the Meyerson Symphony Center <laughs> tonight and tomorrow. Hey, Kenny G, thank you so much for, for coming into WRR. Busy schedule and two big dates. My pleasure. It's fun to be here. Well, if you don't mind, um, this is a classical audience listening to WRR. Let's wow. go back to the beginning with you. We're interested in the saxophone, invented yeah. as a classical instrument by a Frenchman. Way back in the 19th really? century. Really? Right? I didn't know all that. Absolutely. But uh, it took on a life of its own in the 20th century. It's such a heritage. What is it that you remember about being drawn to this instrument as a youngster? Just that I, I like the way it looked when somebody played it. I like the, 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 the idea that they're holding it, breathing into it. It just looked like it would be a lot of fun. I, I took piano lessons at first. When I was six, my mother had me take piano lessons. I didn't really like it that much. And when I saw the sax, I thought, you know, I'd really much rather do that. And fortunately, my parents allowed me to switch I was going to say, if you had a piano teacher, Mom, she might have had some questions about this. Well, you know, mm. I was lucky enough, again, that they didn't, th- they didn't say, no, you have to stick with piano. Mm. Now, when you uh, came to fame, especially with the song Songbird, uh, back in, I guess it was 86, something like that, you surprised a lot of listeners who had no idea there was such thing as a soprano saxophone. They saw you coming out and on stage with this instrument. You were kind enough to play for us. Tell us tell yeah. us about it. Well, this was, you know, I I saw somebody play the soprano saxophone. I, I thought it was a cool-looking instrument. But I, pl- I played alto for the first eight years of my musical education with the saxophone from when I was 10 till I was about, oh, until I was about 17. And then when I was 17, I got a soprano. I got this soprano when I was 17 years old, this particular one I'm holding. And... It's just something about it, you know. Every time it was funny because I wanted it to sound like the sopranos that I heard, and every time I played it, it sounded different. Like my sound was just—I just, just kind of had a tone of my own, and it frustrated me. Now, I'm, obviously, it turned out to be a good thing because I have a unique sound, but it wasn't something that I was actually. Some people ask me, "Well, how do you get your sound?" I said, "I don't know how not to get my sound." You yeah, know? That's risky to have your own sound. Like you say, you're bothered. You had a different sound than everybody else. Yeah. It's, not, it's, it's easier to take the, the middle road and sound like everybody else and get the gigs. Sure. And, but when, whenever I played it, like if I play Songbird. Somebody else plays it. It has a. I, I know my sound's a little mellower. It's got. I don't know how to describe it in words, but it's just. I've always played it like that. Eventually, I, I came to, to like the sound that I have. But at first, it was kind of uh, frustrating a little bit because it just, every time I played it, it sounded like this instrument that I wasn't trying to sound like. Hmm. And it's, and it's amazing because uh, we think of the soprano saxophone as being a maybe higher pitch, maybe yeah. more tense sound, but you're yeah. able to bring such a sweet sound out of Thanks. it. Thanks. Now, um, I understand you had a pretty distinguished gig right off the bat. Barry White, how did this happen? What did he well, find in your, your well, playing? Well, th- this was 17 years old, same, same uh, thing. I was a senior in high school. We were lucky at our high school. We had this thing called a composer in residence. We were a public school, wow. Franklin High in Seattle. And the, the band director found this guy that would write charts for us our, in our jazz band. So we, was, we, were, we weren't playing Main, Maynard Ferguson and Stan Kenton uh, charts. We were playing these. This guy's name was Jim Gardner. Jim Gardner wrote these charts. So they were originals. Anyway, the reason I bring that up was because this guy, this composer, was having lunch with this a symphony guy. That was booking the symphony that was the orchestra that was going to play with Barry White. The Love Unlimited Orchestra isn't really the Love Unlimited Orchestra. It's Barry White's rhythm section with whatever orchestra they put together in the cities that he plays. So when he came to Seattle, they played Seattle, Portland, and Vancouver, one orchestra. Then when they left, they would go whatever they play. If they come to Dallas, they play with the Dallas Symphony. They become the Love Unlimited Orchestra. They're missing one thing: a sax player that could improvise in a let's say an R and B soulful way but had to read music. So the problem was that the, the, the soulful R&B sax players that were around Seattle couldn't read. And the guys that could read couldn't play that style. So the, guy, the composer in residence says, well, there's this kid in, in, in my high school band. He really can do it both. I was a really good sight reader back in the day. And he said, he can do the gig. Well, I was 17. Everybody else was in their 30s. Now, I'm much older than that now. That seems young, but then it seemed old. Anyway, they gave me the gig, and, and I did it, and I got a lot of great accolades for it. I, pl- I did play great. I'll say that when I was 17. I came back to school 
my high school's friends saw, that went to the concert, because I went to a predominantly black school. That's why I could soulfully, so, you know, improvise that way. I was a big hero at school. I was the white guy that was playing with Barry White. And, hey, we didn't know you could play like that. And I got paid, as, as a matter of fact. I got 500 bucks for the weekend. Huge money for playing my saxophone. Are you kidding me? That was like five months' rent. Anyway, it was a great experience for me, and that kind of got me going. Fantastic. Great highlights of your career since then. Of course, uh, you know, we know about the big big hit in, in 86, Songbird. You, you played it for us there. Yeah. What have some of the highlights been since then? You know, there's so much. Well, you know, playing on Johnny Carson was a big deal. It, it started everything, you know. Um, that was not an easy gig to get as well, you know. Back in those days, you know, we're used to smooth jazz radio, and, and we're used to having lots of shows to people play on, Oprah, Ellen, you know, The View, Good Morning America. There was nothing. It was There was Johnny Carson. So for, for an, a sax player to play on Johnny Carson was huge. So that was a, that was a big deal, and to do that was... <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> That's awesome. Anyway, so that, that started things. But since then, you know, I played at the White House uh, for President Clinton. That was a big gig. I like that one. Been on the Grammys. Been on the American Music Awards. Um, played on the Soul Train Music Awards. Been around the world. You know, played for... President of China, uh, the King of Thailand. You know, it's pretty cool. Now, but wait, you've managed another accolade. Uh, coming up um, November 13th, you're heading down to Houston, hoping to win a couple of awards. Tell us about oh that. Oh, my gosh, yeah. That's a new one. A Latin Grammy nominations. Mm-hmm. Two of them. That's for my new album, which is called Rhythm and Romance, all Latin music. And the the there's good to, and there's a sad part to the story. The sad part is that I wanted to do this album. I've been with my record company for 25 years, Clive Davis. Clive is famous now because of American Idol. But I'm, I've been with Clive Davis 25 years. So, you know, and we've sold, you know, 50, 60, set, whatever, whatever the number. I think it's like 70 plus million records. So I said, Clive, I want to do an album of Latin music. And we don't think so. We want you to do a concept album, but it's our concept. I said, but I want to do my concept. No, no, we want you to do our concept. I said, well, what is your concept? Well, you know, you know how Barry Manilow's doing songs of the 60s and 70s and Rod Stewart's doing the Great American Songbook? Why don't you do one of those, which I had already just did? Why don't you do another one? I said, well, I don't want to do that. We want you to. I said, well, what about my Latin idea? No, we don't think it's going to make any money. I said, haven't you guys made enough already? Every CD has to make money now. I said, but we already made so much on these other records. You, in particular, made a lot more than I made. What do you care if it makes money? Let me do what I... Trust me. You, Songbird, Silhouette, my songs. Those are the songs. Trust me. Nope. So he says, if you do this record, you're not going to do it on this label. I said, after 25 years, is that what's going to happen? That's what's going to happen. I said, I guess we're getting divorced. I said, can you at least give me a going away present? No. But that's it? You're just going to drop me like that? That's pretty much the way it is. I said, come on, give me something. 25 years. I've, I've, I've done really well for the company. No. So anyway, so I, I left the company to do this record. And re- the reason for the long story is with the Grammy nominations, it just makes me feel like, you know what? It was it was the right decision. So I knew it was the right anyway. But so once again, it's the same story. You're on your own. You're on your own here. You, you made your own sound with the sax. You eventually had to accept that. You had to accept that you were going to do this this new project. It was important to you. Yeah. What was so important about Latin music, Latin well, dance? Well, it's original music. I wanted to compose the music. He was totally against that. He said, I mean, I quote, you cannot do original music anymore. I said, what do you mean? You mean I can't ever write a song anymore? Nope. No, no, you have to do cover songs. You can't do original music. I said, "That's, but that's what I'm all about. So I, I just knew what was right for me, and I just think that that's... It's a good story because I did what I thought was right. I composed almost all the music, and it gets nominated for two Grammys, one for instrumental and one for best engineered album. Think about that. I mixed this in my home studio. Now That's you, cool. Great sound, too. That's, yeah. one of the, that's one of the awards that it's up for is best, best engineered, engineered album. Engineered album. Now, my, now the people are going to try to book my studio. Oh, it's expensive. Oh, is it expensive? <laughs> <laughs> now, now talk about a beautiful sound. This this thing sounds great with an orchestra, doesn't it? Oh my gosh! You know, to, when we did the rehearsal with the Dallas Symphony today this afternoon, so nice. It's a pleasure. I, I had goosebumps on one song when they were playing because I hadn't heard it with that orchestra. Because I'm when during the rehearsal, I stand next to the conductor in the middle of the orchestra. Tonight I won't, so I won't have that same feeling. But it's really fun to, just to feel that live music and.